I like you to be very focused on this lecture because we're gonna be working on a positional chess today, okay? So I will be showing you one of my games played in 2008 at uh, Chicago Open. And in fact, this game was a very important game. I was playing a Grandmaster Paragua from Philippines, a former over 2,600 player. Uh, and in this game, I was black and uh, I needed to win so I can you know, continue my lead. And I eventually did, and uh, helping to win this big tournament in Chicago. So I'm playing with the black pieces. And it's always a task when you're playing a strong player, what to play and what strategy to, to choose whether or not just try to equalize, try to play something that will offer you some chances as well to play for win. So it's after sh spending some time deciding on a strategy for this game, which I usually, I like to go to the game prepared. I don't like to just go to the game and when he makes a move, I start thinking of what I need to play. I kind of try to decide already which opening, because we have choices. I can play the French, I can play Karokan, many different openings. So I like to decide before the game that I know, okay, if he plays this move, this is how I'm gonna play in this game. And usually when you decide on something, I recommend to go with it. Don't just decide and then go, and then when you're about to play the opening, then you start doubting yourself and trying, well, maybe I do this, maybe I do that. So just try to decide before the game, yes? How often does it happen that, that an opponent will play uh, an unusual opening to try to get you out of your preparation? It happens. It happens, it happens quite often. I mean, I did a lecture uh, a couple of weeks ago it was on the game against Grandmaster Tregubov. Uh, and uh, that was played in the World Cup 2009. And uh, we knew the pairing. So he knew he's going to play me like three weeks in advance. And I knew it also. So I prepared against him extensively, looking at all his games and preparing. He would play Slav defense, Nimzo Indian. And suddenly, when uh, I went all the way to Siberia to play this tournament, and we arrived, the first game I'm playing with the white pieces, I played d4. He goes f5. I couldn't find a single game in a database that he plays f5. So this happens quite a lot. People are surprised. But not always it's going to be really good. Just It's not like just you surprise somebody and you're going to win a game. So he did that, but it didn't turn out good for him. He lost in like 27 moves. So, But uh, you know, you ha really, if you're surprising somebody, you should have knowledge. You know? Maybe that didn't work out well. You would have won in 25 moves if you played as usual. So. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Yeah, a anyway, uh, yeah, uh, it was a you know, very interesting, very, very long match against him. I mean, I eventually won, but it was this, uh, they call it a marathon match because we played 16 games. So it was like, uh, it was equal, and then he would win one, I would win one. <laughs> yeah, f finally I won the final score of that match because somebody needed to win to advance to the next stage. So finally I won 9-7 nine, nine to seven that match. So that's the longest the history, uh, the longest history of these matches, you know. So it's just like, so anyway, uh, so yeah, you have to really know about the opening when you're going to surprise somebody. So it's, uh, you know, so he played e4, which I expected, so I played d6. A little bit of a surprise because, you know, most people know that I play the French defense, and, uh, but sometimes I could play this opening, and this is called a check perk. So it's not, uh, if I play g6, it's just going to be the normal perk defense. So, but I played c6. Uh, my coach uh, taught me this, international master Nadanian, back in Armenia a long time ago, maybe when I was 10, 12 years old, he taught me this opening. And I've always played in the childhood, but then I stopped playing for a while. But I, nowadays, I still play it sometimes. So you could see that, you know, in m my games, you know, I use it. It's, it's an opening that a lot of players playing with why they're not, like you play c6 and that, they're not so familiar with it. Even if they know, they only know a few moves. But you really ha have to know more about this opening if you get an advantage. So I played many games with this and have some really good results with it actually. My uh, winning percentage is very high and almost like maybe one or two losses the uh, entire time. So I mean it's, uh, I score well with this opening but I don't play it all the time because against uh, when I play very, very high rated opponents, it's uh, a bit risky. So, but in this game, I decided to play against him, so he played f4. And this is the, the best move, in my opinion, and the move that white needs to play if he wants to fight for advantage. Anything else he plays, it's just going to be a normal game, I think, about, with about roughly equal chances. But this is the move that, you know, uh, principled move to play. 
So it looks like for a moment White has the control of the center and he's going to just develop his pieces and according to our principles he's just going to have a nice position. But it's not so simple because we play Queen A5 here. And uh, now my threat is Knight takes E4. And I've had people actually play Knight F3 here. Strong players even, you know. And I took the pawn on E4. So missing, you know, the threat. So remember, main idea is just to pin. And now threatening Knight E4. So let me ask you this. Who is familiar with this opening? OK, Ben is probably familiar with this. But who else except Ben? Any, anybody else familiar with this opening? Like if you were, let's say I'm playing you. I play this move, Queen A5. What would you do here? Let's say you know the threat. Threat is knight takes e4, right? There are three different moves you can play here. Bishop d2? Bishop d2 is a move. It's one of the main moves. Any other alternatives? Knight e2? Well, see, the thing is, if you go knight e2, you're not really stopping this threat. Oh, so the threat is still there, OK? What so about you. The bishop? What about the bishop go to uh, queen? Uh, Bishop d3? Correct, yeah. This is the most popular move. This is what he played. So we'll look at that. And another move here is uh, e5. They play. So these are the three moves that you know uh, he can play. So if you're looking for an opening, it's, it's a little bit unorthodox, but still very, very interesting. You may want to you know, do a little bit of research, and you're going to see this game today, and maybe add this to your op opening repertoire. Okay. So you can have your main openings, but on the side, you know, you can have this. Sometimes you can play as a surprise factor. So now I'm threatening to take the pawn. So you play the most. Most people, I tell you, are going to play bishop d3. This is what most people did against me. So now you play e5. It's a very important move. And they play knight f3. There are other alternatives here to play for white, but the best move is knight f3. For example, uh, I've had this position. My, my, my recent game in this opening was against Steven Zurich, uh, as a former world uh, U champion. And I don't think he was very familiar with this opening. So when I played him in the National Open last year, Las Vegas, he took. Took and played knight f3, this move. And this is already not so good for white, because I just played bishop g4. And he took and black to play. Let's see if we can find the best move in this position. So let's say you're playing with the black pieces here. What would you do here? OK. Well, but that's, that's actually what he, he wants you to do. Then look, you move the bishop twice. One, two. You lose a tempo right there. And then you're going to allow him to develop another piece. And now we move the queen again twice, right? So this could really very quickly backfire, yeah, after bishop f4. If you look at, just look at the position, you can already tell that black is in trouble because white has four pieces developed. And your queen is under attack. That means you have to move again, losing another tempo. So you're in big trouble, OK? So it's very dangerous to go for this. OK? So you don't want to do that. You want to take back only 5 with a knight in this position. OK? Because when you take back with a knight, your knight will be very well placed. And remember, knight will block his isolated pawn as well. Usually, you want to use a knight to block opponent pawn, yeah? Knight f to d7 I played in this game. And uh, then I took the pawn. Anyway, this is another very interesting game. In some point, maybe I will show this game as well, you know, as a continuation to the same topic, you know. But uh, this is already good for black because I just take back with a knight. And then I put my other knight on d7. And dark square bishop comes out, and I castle. So I have a, a pretty comfortable position here. And he cannot do that much here, OK? What if he tries to kick your bishop out by I think he did that. He played here. I took. Oh, okay. And then I take back with the knight. Important, I want to take back with the knight because then I want to have a centralized piece. OK? So uh, anyway, so my opponent, uh, you know, he played here. 
Now you develop a knight. Okay. Now there's a very nice trap I want to show you. I've won actually a lot of games with this trap. Usually in a blitz game, some rapid games, beat some strong players actually. So I'd like you to know this trap. So there is a move e takes d4 here. I've played this move in many occasions actually. I prefer to play knight bd7 here, but you know I've played this move before many games and I've analyzed this move. So he takes. Now you play this strange kind of looking move queen b6. You move the queen again. So they're wasting a tempo. But again, it's not so easy for white to move here. So you cannot develop your bishop because your b2 pawn will be hanging. Right? So most people play here. And I've played here. Now I'm threatening to play a4. So usually in this position, they play two moves. You know, most uh, people play a4. But when they play a4, you just simply develop your bishop and castle. And then you have this idea of knight a6, knight b4. You have a good square for the knight. It's a good outpost there for the knight. So that's why some players think black is just playing really bad. So they just want to take advantage of it. So they go here. Now you continue playing a4. And again, they just, you know, they play logical. Yeah, they, you, you're making some pawn moves. They're developing. And suddenly in this position, you go queen b4. Looks like, again, what is black doing? I mean, he just keep on moving the queen, you know? He's going to lose. Now they play a3, and then and white is just, you know, thinking, OK, I win this game. I trap the queen. See, I had this position happen many times. Must have at least won 10 games with, with black. Not tournament games, but blitz and rapid. And so I take. So he takes my queen. Check. Now, if it comes up, I take another rook. So I already have a minor piece I took and a rook. So some people go here quickly, thinking, OK, we go here in castle. And I play bishop g4, and they resign. <laughs> so it's a good trap to know. Because if you're playing this, you, you, especially in blitz, you can definitely win a few games like this. Okay. And now it's just over. You take on d1, you take on h1. A4. A4, a4 is a necessary move. But again, they have to know this. And during the game, it's very hard to know all these you know, sequences. So yeah, but I mean, this position, I mean, if you analyze this position, computer will say white is a little bit better. But it's playable. I've played it before. You got bishop e7, castle, knight a6, knight b4. OK? Yes? There are some things learned by uh, the people who play when you seen that your queen was trapped, uh -huh. did you actually anticipate that before you actually moved that down there to that beat? Yeah, yeah, of course. You have to so calculate so that. You say, OK, I'm going to go here. Now, I know it's trapped, but I still should come out. You, 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 you saw that combination? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, of course. Otherwise, you can just uh, make all these moves with the queen without you know, analyzing the position, because you will simply lose your queen in the game. So I, I mean, I, I saw up to the move bishop g4 that I have this move. Otherwise, it's just it's just really bad play by black. But uh, so, yeah, you play bishop e7 here. And castle, knight a6. Maybe, maybe white is a little bit better, but it's, it's a game. So but yeah, I played this knight bd7 move here. So he castles. Bishop e7, king h1, prophylactic move, I castle. Now he played uh, here. And now in this position, after he played bishop e3, I want to give you a chance to find the next move. Okay? <laughs> it's black. He just played bishop e3. Okay? So you go, you're only going to be finding the moves for black in this game. So black to play, what would be the best move in this position? It's a hard move to find, but. It's a necessary move in this kind of positions. If you have an opportunity also, you want to play this move. I think knight to uh, g, d5, g4. Well, knight to g4, it's, see, this is just no, a one move, knight, one move. Here, okay, yeah, it's just a one move threat. It's, you make one move threat, then he goes here, and your knight is kind of misplaced here. Yeah. So and then he can, 
he can maybe move you back and so Well, b5 is, b5 is a move that we want to play. Not always we get to play this move because m sometimes they put the pawn on a4. But here he didn't. So here he I played b5. He no, I played b5. b5 is the right move here because with pawn on b5 in this position, so you have more space. And most important thing is you always have this b4 threat idea. And you have a place to develop your bishop, OK? So sometimes they don't let you do that. But in this position, I managed that because if he takes, I had to make sure this line works for me. This is a key line here. He takes. And for example, if I don't have this move here, then it's a bad position for me. But thanks to this move here, I'm, I'm better maybe. So what's the move? Now before. Now before, excellent. Not only you move the knight back, now you increase the pressure on this pawn. So he has to go back, and then you simply take. Take, and again, you reach a position like this where you have, you always want to have a knight blocking that pawn. Knight is the best piece to block pawns like that, okay? And now his light square bishop is passive, and it's, it's a comfortable position for block here. You play bishop, probably bishop e6, rook a d8, and it's uh, good. So he played. After I played b5, he played queen d2. Developing move. But what do you think? Is it just developing, or he has a threat now? Is it just developing, or he has some threat? Exactly, it's a typical threat. Okay, when opponent has a queen on a5, you put a queen on two, you threaten knight d5. For example, you go bishop b7, knight d5, attacking your queen. You take his queen, he has an in between check. Okay, very important in between check. You have to go away, and then he takes it. Okay, good. And you know. It, well, if you allow this, then the only thing to do is to go back. But uh, this is when you lose your bishop, it's it's not good in this position because he has a center and two bishops. So this would be a much better game for White. So now I played here. What should I do? Another typical move now needs to be played. You can move the bishop back. Move back on d8. Yeah, but look, if you put a bishop here, this will, uh, you know, disconnect, uh, you know, the communication for the rooks, and yeah, it doesn't look that good, yeah. I don't know, maybe knight takes uh, e4. Knight takes here? No, no, this. Well, the problem with this move now, he goes, your queen might be a little bit awkward after e3, you know? And this b4 pawn might get a little bit pressure, too. So this next move is actually really necessary. Otherwise, um, I'm just worse. In this opening, one of the key uh, factors is you have to make sure you keep control of the e5 square. So you need to control the e5 square. This is very important, OK? Which move? Yeah, but he's got a lot of pressure here. This is the key. He always going to have a lot of, he's putting lots of pressure here. So we have to control it. We can't go away. Queen c7, yes. What about knight g4 here? Is that playable? It's, well, what about the same threat? Same threat, yeah? Be careful. So I went here. Very good. And here my opponent should have probably played rook ae1, something you know, solid. 
it's a game, unclear game. So he played a4. He's trying to take advantage of my early push b5. So my next move it's necessary. I mean, I can protect on b5. I can play a6 because he just takes, takes, he just takes, takes, you take the rook. So he has to go b4. Now, knight e2. And now, a very important move you have to find. If you don't play this move, you're going to be slightly worse. But after the next move, it's at least equal. Perhaps black has the initiative. Think, think, don't try. This is not just a regular move. This is. Uh, it's, a it's yeah. This this idea in this opening in this opening this uh, this idea works. I've done it in different positions, but. It has to be exactly like this, the pawn structure. So think about it a little bit. Huh? Um. <laughs> OK, uh, c5, um, c5 probably not so good because he just, uh, let's see, why c5 is not good. Um, Maybe takes. Just uh, creating, we created a lot of weak square, yeah? This d5. I know the c4 is a threat here, but perhaps even just b3 maybe you can play here. So I'm not sure about this d5 square. So the strong move here is? Oh, very good, yes. d5. See, I'm trying to take advantage of the fact that his e4 square is not very well protected. And he has his pieces are placed this way, so I can have this threat of playing e4. So basically, I'm breaking the center now. If I can break the center, exchange some of these pawns, then I can have uh, some initiative. Very strong move d5. Let's take a look. Now, so many different captures, so we have to now analyze these captures. So first capture, just very bad, losing. Why? Pawn fork. So this is just the first thing out. He could take with the knight. This is a possibility. But then we just take with the knight, attacking his queen. And if he goes back, we just go f6, remove the strong knight. Takes, we take. And I think black is maybe slightly better here, because my knight is still very strong. I will go bishop d6, rook a1, and I have a nice uh, you know, development. and So black is maybe a little better. So he plays, um, he played pawn takes. He took with this pawn, which is natural to take. So open up the file for the rook. Now, what do you think I should do here? Well, you can play knight takes e4, but then he just moves his queen, and I mean, he's got that strong pawn on e5. I like to get some position where he doesn't have this strong pawns in my territory, and I have a way to do that here. Well, then he takes on d5. Think about it. You already know this idea of playing e4, right? Mm -hmm. Forking those pieces. For a moment, think about this. If, let's say, he's not attacking your knight on f6, what would you do? Of course you take on e4 because you want to fork him. So now he takes. It looks like a problem. We cannot take his pieces because he's going to take, he's going to take. But we just take now. For a moment, we're down a piece. But next one, we're going to get the piece back. And as you can see, no more strong center for him. Okay? The reason he took with the f pawn to be able to have an open file for the rook. 
Okay? He could have get the same position with a pawn on f4, but I think this is better version for white. You know, he has a central pawn and open file. So now he plays bishop f4, attacking the queen. Bishop d6 is one idea, but what else you can try to do? Well, he wants to take your queen. So he wants to take your queen. Bishop d6 is a possible move, but I, the move in the game I think is a little bit better. Because my goal in this position is to get his light square bishop. If I can get his light square bishop, then I will have the pair of the bishops. If I go bishop d6, he can just exchange. And uh, probably going to be okay. Well, you need to move your queen. Queen is under attack, but you need to find a good square to move. Okay, because, for example, if you put the queen on d7, this will be very bad. He will just go knight d5, and we what lose a piece. Queen to uh, a5. Yeah, queen to a5, not so good. Knight e5. And then you take the bishop, because you have to take the bishop. Otherwise, you're down a piece. And then he takes on c6, takes on e7 check. And well, here actually you might just be losing. Where? Back where? That's the problem, yeah. And bishop takes. Bishop takes. You can't. You can't even go back. So you you just lose, yeah. So you have to be careful. See, there are some uh, problems. Which is you can't just move the queen anywhere and thinking, okay, I'm going to get the piece back. You need to put the queen somewhere that it's not going to be able. He's not going to be able to attack again. Queen d8. There's a problem with that move. You know, he oh, plays oh, here. Yeah, it's the same knight fork. Basically. And fork. I mean, we're not going to lose a piece in this case, but. Uh, we're down a pawn, okay? So it's not got that good. B7 is the right square, yes. Not, you don't want to go here because then he has a5. So go to b7. Okay, now I'm going to win the piece back. Um, he could try to play bishop c4, but then I get some uh, initiative. I take, he takes, bishop g4. And he's going to lose some tempos going back. And rook okay, yeah, then I think I have uh, you know, pretty nice game here. I can play c5 next. Maybe about, you know, maybe close to equal again. But I think I have good development here. So he decided to give up the bishop, but have a little bit more activity. So he played here. I took the bishop, and he takes. Now we reach this position. So what I want you to do, I want you to take a look at this for a few minutes and try to evaluate this position. Okay? If let's say you are playing this for black, what you should be aiming for? It's the what is the evaluation of this position? Is it equal? White is better, black is maybe slightly better. What are the pluses for black? What are the minuses? Just try to evaluate. Okay, it's white why is slightly better. Okay, well let's let's think for a few minutes. For a few minutes, let's think. It's not always just if the pieces look good, then it means it's better. You have to also see what opponent has. Okay? So what opponent can try to do here. So it's a... Uh, if you just look here, yeah, you may think, okay, white pieces are more active, so it's better. But it's black to move, by the way. It's very important. So who do you think is better here, and what should be the black's next plan in this position? That would be nice. 
develop the pieces and connect the rooks, okay? But the very important thing you need to try to do here, you have to make sure you don't exchange one of your bishops. Because if you want to get advantage, you have to have your both bishops in this position. Because you have the advantage of the pair of the bishops here. Okay, so that's a very important thing. So I play knight d5, attacking his bishop. And now he goes bishop g5. He's offering the exchange of the bishops. What do you think I should do? You already know. I mentioned. F6, of course. But F6, yeah. Now I played F6. He went back. And now he's threatening to go knight F5 and take the bishop. So he felt like F6 is a little bit weakening my position. The weakening is E6 square. And but the next plan is very strong and important to play. You could play queen a6, but he goes queen e4, for example. You need to get, you need to prepare, you know, be prepared against the move knight f5. Because he wants to go knight f5, he wants to get one of your bishops, dark square bishop or light square bishop. So you have to try to do something. Well, think a little bit more. Think a little bit more. When you put the rook on d8, right? Yeah, it's probably okay place. But where do you want to put the rook usually? Open file. Open file, right? And you gotta imagine, you play, move the rook. He's gonna go knight f5. Your idea was to move the bishop to f8, yeah? Yeah. Where do you want to have your rook? Imagine in that position. You want to have the rook on d8 or on e8? E8, right? Yeah. Always remember, you want to rook on an open file. It's very important. So you go rook E8. It's a very important, like it's like a prophylactic move. I see his idea, I make this move, so when he comes up, I go here. Most important thing, I keep the pair of the bishops. Pawn on F6 is actually well placed because it's controlling important squares, so he doesn't have any attack. And now, what I would like to do, I would like to play a5, queen a6, exchange the queens off the board. Then I have a very pleasant endgame. It's still probably slightly better, but it's much easier to play for black because I have a strong knight on d5, two bishops, and in some point, light squares is going to be a problem for him because he's missing that light square bishop. And now, he plays knight f to h4. Probably an inaccurate move. Idea behind it, he wants to bring the queen to g3 and create some threats. But now I have a very strong sequence after which I will force the exchange of the queens and get to that favorable endgame. How can you do that? How can you force the exchange? So if you go queen a6, he can just go queen g3. So we can't really do force that. The move may seems like a risky move at first, but it's a concrete move. You just calculate. Yeah. Well, well, he wants to go queen g3. I don't want to. I don't want to let him go queen g3 because it's quite annoying. Then he has this knight h6 threat, and he has some initiative. Yeah, you could you could do that, but that's not really going to help us force the exchange. 
The way I played, I forced him to exchange queens in just two moves. If I'm a queen c7, he's not going to go queen g3 because he doesn't want to go to endgame. He knows he's just much worse in the endgame with you know maybe s some ch small chances to hold. So he doesn't want to do that. But his last move was a bit awkward too. Yeah, he put the knight on the side of the board. So think about it. What can you do? G5. Correct. G5. Correct move. G5. Now attacking the knight. Okay. If he plays queen g3, trying to keep the pressure on, I just calmly go here. King h8. And now he has to sacrifice because he can't just go back knight f3 because then I take the knight. So he has to take, I take, he takes, but uh, he, he doesn't have sufficient compensation here because my pieces are placed very well. He doesn't really have a threat here. So all the important squares are protected. I probably uh, just take on f5 here and think of ideas just to liquidate. He doesn't, it, it, it may look kind of threatening, a position like this. He's got the queen, two knights, but if you look carefully, can you spot a threat here for him? Can, does he have any threat? Let's say we pass the turn and say, okay, move again. Can he create a threat? See, F6 is guarded, very important, G7, G6. So. Probably just take, take and go something like rook e6, double up the rooks, and think about some exchanging, exchange pieces, rook g6. So he didn't do that. When I played g5, he now uh, really regretted playing this move because now he has to go back. But g5 is a type of move that you, know, you don't expect your opponent to make. It's unexpected, you just push the pawn in front of the king. Looks like creating weaknesses. But my bishop on f8 is a very important piece. One of my best pieces is the bishop on f8 here. Not only guarding d6, also h6 square. And now, what is the idea? Absolutely, queen a6. And now he cannot move the queen away because the knight is hanging. See? Now he has forced, now he's forced to take on a6. And that will allow me, another plus is, take back with the bishop, a develop a piece, and gain a tempo. See, g5, that's a key move in this game. g5 takes bishop a6. Now, he played rook f1. We know that black is better here already, but what do you think the evaluation is? Is it slightly better, equal plus, or is it minus plus, a big advantage? You think slightly? See, it's not always you need to have material advantage to able to see if it's a small advantage or big advantage. Sometimes there are positions you don't even have material advantage. It's equal position, but opponent needs to resign, for example. But so you think slightly. Any anybody else? Mm -hmm. um, honestly, during the game, I thought my advantage is quite significant. I thought uh, I have good winning chances, and I knew if I play well, I should be able to win this game. Because I have a pair of the bishops, a very strong knight on d5, and a very this is also a very strong pawn here. It just it stops him from advancing his pawns. And he doesn't have any counterplay. And basically, I, I have all the play here. Yes? Shouldn't he push uh, c3, and then if you exchange, just take with the d pawn, and then? But then again, you don't have a good plan, yeah? You can push c4 anyway. Yes. Then I could use the b file. I could swap one pair of the rooks, take only one, you take, and I go rook b8. Now I start entering on a c b file. Oh. 
So that's another idea. But in this position, I would like to find the next move, a really important move here you need to find. Block him. He just played, his last move was rook f1. What would you do here? What do you think is the important move here to play? Huh? Uh huh. <laughs> See, remember, when you get it into end game, remember, it's very important. You get the king closer to the center. Uh, what about, I, like, I like the h part, but not the king and the h part. What's wrong? Uh huh. We just had the white line bishop back to c eight. That drops the rook. Hmm? That drops the rook. Oh, it drops the rook. Yeah. So I'm thinking, uh, well, also, Preston, it's very important for you. Rem remember. <laughs> but also, even if you're not dropping a rook, right? Yeah. Your piece is already active. So you don't want to just go back, attack something, and deactivate the piece. Because look, after you do that, you're going to have to move that piece again. So you may think like you're gaining a tempo, but you're going to make your piece worse. So you don't want to do that. H5 is an interesting idea. Or just a simple G4. G4, got to be a little bit cautious because, you know, that H4 square. See? But, I mean, that takes away a lot of piece activity, though, doesn't it? Well, th his knight is not active on F3. I, I would like him to just le stay there. Longer he stays there, better for me because the knight can't go anywhere. King to F7? Correct. Mm -hmm. Very strong move, King F7, because you bring the king into the game, too. Can it takes. And then play king f7 and, uh, and then bring the a rook to the e file? You could, but I want to do that. I, I don't want to take and give up the file. I want to keep the tension on and bring my king up. If I want to do it, I can do it later because he's not going to move the rook away. Then I go rook e2. OK? Yeah, I mean, five control so you five. move the king up, you still have that idea if you want to do it. But I'm not sure if I really want to exchange the rooks in this position. I may want to exchange one pair of the rooks, but not two. Because I might want to use, because I have more activity. If I exchange both rooks, I'm still better. But I might want to keep the rooks, one pair of the rooks, OK? And this is very important. When I see a lot of games I watch played, I see if there is an open file, players tend to just automatically just exchange rooks. But you really have to think, because you know, like in this position, I think exchanging both pair of the rooks would be a slight inaccuracy for black. Because he should exchange one pair of the rooks and try to create pressure with the other rook. Because his pieces are more active. OK? So now he plays here. OK, he played here. Now he moved the knight back. Now he is trying to go to e4 and c5. So if his knight reaches on c5, then I need to make a decision. The knight is very strong, will attack my bishop. If I take on d6, again, I'm a little bit better, but then we enter into some opposite color bishops, and drawing chances are going to increase. So what do you do here? He wants to put the knight on c5. You don't want to allow that. Excellent. He has a central pawn. You exchange that pawn. And that takes away that idea, OK? So he takes, I take, knight e4 attacking the bishop. And by the way, another idea c5 is good here. When you have the pair of the bishops, you want to open the position. And that's what c5 does. Now it's an open board. And open board, two bishops are very strong. So they're more effective. So wait, is there like any rule of thumb for? Moving the pawn from the knight out. At what point is it okay to? I mean, it's a strong knight now. You know, being defended with the pawn. But I mean, is it just that he doesn't? Oh, you mean my knight? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, my knight is still going to be stronger. It's not like he can remove it. My main concern is his knight getting to the square. I want to eliminate this square fr 
for his knight because I don't want his knight to get to c5. Would it, would it make a difference if he still has a white bishop? If he had a white bishop, the position is it would be completely different. It would be really a completely different because then I wouldn't be able to easily go king f7. I would have to worry about bishop h5 checks. It, it really it would be completely different position here. So it's uh, that's why it's c5. You have to go. This is a very important move. So he took. I took knight e4, activating the knight, now attacking your bishop. And remember, I mentioned already the importance of having the pair of the bishops. So what do you do now? Absolutely. I don't want to put the bishop here because this will block your rook. So you got bishop f8. And now I have lots of pressure. My rook is very active on e5, putting pressure on my bishop on a6. Knight is good on d5. My next one is going to be rook c8, putting some more pressure. So he plays here. Knight d4. He's trying to get something going. He wants to go knight f5, knight d6. Now. You could go king g6, but now you have a piece that it looks active, but this piece actually could be on a better square and putting more pressure. Okay. Correct. Bishop to b7. See some point when the time is right, I want to be able to move my knight on g2 and have the pressure. And here we realize the, the strength of this bishop. Okay. And I will move my rook. That's coming up soon, too. But right now, I, you know, he's already, he needs to worry about some discovery ideas that I have. So very, very unpleasant position to play. So he went knight f2, because he was worried about some potential discoveries with my knight. So he moved the knight. Maybe he could have left the knight there. But again, I will go rook a d8, and very comfortable for me, that position. Now. Now, by going back now, this will allow me to activate another piece that I have. Bishop to c5. OK. Let's see if we can. Yeah, it looks like we don't have that, but it still shows. OK. OK. Bishop c5, activating the bishop, of course, putting pressure. Now, only move is c3. And. A very important move you need to find here. Black to play. What would be the best move in this position? How they move the, the root is on A8 to uh, B, B8. Close. Very close. C8. Because I want to be able to take and go rook c2. Very strong rook a c8. See, not exchanging. Just going here because I want him to exchange. Because I, then I can take back with my rook. So now I have some threats of taking and going rook c2. Many different threats. So he decided to go back knight e4. And now, see, I built up, built up, and we got to the position where he made this move. And now, you need to find the winning continuation now to conclude this game. He was hoping I will go back to f8, and he will get knight f5, knight d6, some threats. But he perhaps overlooked what I can try to do here. Can you not just continue with the idea of uh, bishop takes and then, uh, uh, boom. Yeah, never mind. That would be a very unpleasant fork. OK? <laughs> that was the point. He wants to have some you know, pressure on me on d6.
Oh, pawn takes, pawn takes. My pawn is strong on before. I don't want to just trade. I need to find tactical continuation. Because all my pieces are improved, I think, to their you know, maximum. So here, I have so much pressure, so eventually something should come out, yeah, for me. Okay, you know the follow-up. <laughs> okay, well, it's, 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 it's the winning idea. Good job. I was thinking you can discover an attack with a rook. Okay. So probably probably uh, knight takes c3. Yeah. There you go. There you go. I took and I took on c3. Now I'm down exchange. But it's okay. Now his knight is also weak on d4. If he just takes back my knight, then I take the rook. Remember I mentioned to you when I put the, pit, put the bishop back, I'm going to do some potential discoveries. And we see it happen. So if he goes away, then I probably have few ways to win, but I think the simple would be h5 here, just to attack the rook, deflect it, and win the knight. Okay. So he went back because you know he's he realized he's probably losing, but at least he wants to have the extra exchange. Continue. Bishop takes nine. Absolutely. He takes. Of course, take with a pawn. Now I have two bishops still, two pawns, and a very strong pawn on c3. So going back to c1 is just very bad. So you go bishop c3, e3. Now what do you do here? Well, you could do that, but in some point, eventually, you have to. You can't just keep your bishops all the time. So when you see a win, you just have to go for it already. Okay? You could keep the bishop, but then he takes on a7. I don't know. He, he, it's so in some point, you have to already, you can't just keep the best pieces all the time. Eventually, at some point, you're going to have to, don't be too attached. Yeah? It's good to know when to exchange them also. Okay, so Well, I took, he took, I played c2. And he resigned here, actually. It may seem like a bit early resignation, but in fact, he knew what was going to be my next move. So he has to go probably rook to c1. And now, very strong move. It's a similar idea that I'm going to do. Oh, okay. it's, it, it's the same idea, basically. Correct. Rook to d8. He can't, he, can't take the pawn. he can't take the pawn because of the background checkmate. And now he can try to get out of it by playing king g1. Check. Force the rook back. Passive. And now what do you do? Do you want to exchange the rooks? Or do you want to keep your rook? Of course, protecting your pass pawn and, and still threatening right. still yeah. threatening to win a pawn. Now I win the third pawn, so I will have a bishop and three pawns. And the most important thing, he has no counterplay. See, if he had some kind of counterplay, then I have to worry about it, but he has no counterplay. So he's going to have to play g3. How do we win a pawn in this kind of positions? You check him with the rook. Check him with the rook. If he goes to the corner, Did you, uh, check the pawn check? mate. So he has to go here. Now you take the pawn. You take the pawn. And still, he has no counterplay. He can move the rook up. If he moves the rook up, you have check, take. So he goes here. And now you simply come back. You don't want to win the g pawn and lose the c2 pawn. c2 pawn is very strong. You always want to keep that pawn. And then you just continue. 
f5, put the bishop on e4, and then you could win uh, many different ways. You can just push the h-pawn all the way to h2. You can activate your king to g4. What about open the bishop on the uh, f3? Uh, you mean c6? You here? Uh, here? No. Well, what's the idea? I mean, you want to put on but d1? Yeah, he probably. I would. I would. Yeah, I, I. I would just put the bishop here. And just start pushing. I mean, here I can go rook g2. So anyway, as you can see, it's a completely losing position. So there are. Well, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you can't do So my opponent resigned. Uh, I mean, seems a bit early, but you know it's. At that point, he, he already knew that I would just play rook d8. And so I activate my rook to the second round, start winning more pawns, and he can't really do anything. If he goes back here trying to just play a passive defense, how would you win this position? What can you do to win this? The most efficient way to win it. I like that. I like the plan with the king to b2. There are many ways to win, but I think uh, uh, king to b2 would be the idea that I would do. What Just get the king. What do you think? Uh, you put your bishop on Yeah, I would probably put the bishop here. Now so I was thinking of c6, and then with the idea of bishop a4, and then you can uh, exchange on uh, d1. You could do that, but... The easiest way would be to centralize your bishop. So if it goes here, you put the pawn on f5. And you can put the pawn on f4. And you simply move the king to b2. So, And I mean, there really, there are so many ways to win this position. But you reach this position, OK? And now you're threatening to take on g2 and go c1 queen. So if it goes here. You can just take, and you just queen, and you have two pawns up in the king and pawn end game. Okay, or another idea you could have done is just simply uh, push the pawn to a5, win the a4 pawn. Really, this is like so many ways to win. So, because the, my pieces are just dominating, strong pawn on c2, strong rook on d2, and the bishop on b7. Okay. Mm -hmm.